This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video continues lectures 12 to 14 in Seminar 2. In the previous video, I discussed the imaginary, real, and symbolic and began to develop their connection to dream interpretation. Today we explore how Lacan deploys these three registers to Freud's dream of Irma's injection. And so in this video I address the following questions. One, what is Freud's dream and how does he interpret it? Two, how does Lacan understand this dream? And three, what are the problems with the concept of regression? This channel addresses works of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Each video, organized by three questions, examines a section unpacking its ideas as we work through the entirety of the text. To support this work, please consider liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. You can also support this work on Patreon. The link is below in the description. The dream occurred following a real-life conversation with his friend Otto about Freud's patient. Freud detected in the tone of Otto's voice a veiled criticism concerning his approach to Irma's treatment. Freud subsequently has the dream, which he writes down upon waking. In the dream, he approaches Irma who reveals physical symptoms suggestive of something organic. He proceeds to look down her throat and notices whitish gray scabs. Freud then calls in Dr. M, who repeats and confirms the observation. Then Otto and another friend, Leopold, appear in the dream and start examining her as well. They conclude it's an infection that was the result of a poor decision by Otto, who previously gave Irma an injection of trimethylamine with a syringe that had probably not been cleaned. Freud saw the formula of this solution printed in heavy type during the dream. I left off several significant details, but hopefully I've provided what is sufficient for appreciating the main points made here in this video. Freud uses this dream to illustrate a central thesis of his work, the interpretation of dreams, which is that dreams represent unconscious wish fulfillments masked by the literal dream thoughts. In this case, the dream alleviates Freud of responsibility for Irma's condition, transferring that responsibility onto Otto, who in real life had annoyed Freud with the perceived slight delivered by him. So for Freud, the dream offers the wish fulfillment of a revenge fantasy on Otto. However, Freud does admit that much more could be drawn from the dream, keeping the possibility open for other and perhaps more satisfying interpretations. I say satisfying because Lacan has some notable difficulties with this interpretation. He asks, how is it that Freud, who later on will develop the function of unconscious desire, is here content for the first step in his demonstration to present a dream which is entirely explained by the satisfaction of a desire which one cannot but call pre-conscious and even entirely conscious? The dream appears not to be a good demonstration of Freud's central theory. After mentioning some other interpretations, such as the one provided by Eric Erickson, Lacan offers his own, basing it upon the three registers of the imaginary real and symbolic. Lacan finds some significance in the real-life conversation with Otto preceding the dream. Something was left unsaid in the conversation that made it a kind of interrupted speech. If we recall from a previous video on repetition, it's the failures or interruptions that produce a compulsion to repeat exemplified by the Zagarnik effect. Now, as for the dream itself, Lacan posits one of his major principles for dream interpretation, to locate the ego or egos and to not confuse it for the subject. During waking life, we ordinarily don't have the kind of fracturing of ego images that one has in a dream, in part because the signifier holds everything together. However, if the dream is the conversion of the signifier into an image, then that stabilization provided by the signifier no longer produces the same effects. The subject undergoes a process of disintegration in this dream upon encountering the anxiety-inducing image of viewing down Irma's throat and observing signs of infection. Here we encounter the real. Lacan offers an insightful commentary here worth quoting in its entirety. There is a horrendous discovery here, that of the flesh one never sees, the foundation of things, the other side of the head, of the face. 
the secretory glands par excellence, the flesh from which everything exudes, at the very heart of the mystery, the flesh in as much as it is suffering is formless, in as much as its form in itself is something which provokes anxiety. Specter of anxiety, identification of anxiety, the final revelation of you are this, you are this which is so far from you, this which is the ultimate formlessness. We've previously discussed how the real is the material substrate of our organs. It's also the unstructured energy of the libido. I like the term Adrian Johnston uses here, playing off of the word corporeal to use the word corporeal. This is the real body as opposed to the imaginary one. Exposure to it is destabilizing, and that destabilization helps to make sense of the subsequent arrival of three characters in the dream, Dr. M, Otto, and Leopold. Each character is important and represents the site of ego identification for Freud. Dr. M is the imaginary father, Otto is the friend who is both enemy and friend, and so is in the fluctuations of imaginary love and hate, and Leopold is the beloved enemy. What is being played out here is the history of the ego itself, decomposed of its imaginary unity before the sight of the real object. So where does the subject come into play here? First, Lacan notes that in the dream, the subject decomposes, fades away, and dissociates into its various egos. What remains is an acephalic subject, a subject without an ego, decentered in relation to the ego. So instead, the subject is to be located in the emergence of the word trimethylamine. This is the last word of the dream, which is significant for being a word. Here Lacan makes an interesting interpretation that departs from Freud. The wish of the dream is fulfilled in that Freud had wished to discover the secret of dreams, a wish that's fulfilled in the concluding word of the dream. What is revealed then is that the word, the signifier, is the key to dream interpretation. To quote Lacan, the meaning of the dream is revealed to Freud that there is no other word of the dream than the very nature of the symbolic. As such, though Freud's initial interpretation of the dream seemed to provide no insight into the core theory of unconscious desire, it acquires the status of paradigmatic dream for Lacan because it illustrates the central place of the signifier as the key to the dream process and the unconscious more generally. It's the word that produces the analytic symptom, just as it's the trimethylamine that produces Irma symptoms. And just as the decomposition of the subject reveals the multiplicity of egos in groups of threes, the three male characters being just one example of this. Similarly, the decomposition of the formula for trimethylamine also produces a series of triplets, which Lacan points out and notes the connection. This is a somewhat surprising twist by Lacan in that he turns Freud's dream into a kind of meta-dream, a dream that discloses the interpretive key of dreams. The fact that Freud uses this dream rather than any other as the key example to illustrate this theory of dreams, and the fact that his initial interpretation fails to support that theory, leads Lacan to make his own interpretation that he believes does demonstrate the critical role of unconscious desire in dreams. Now let us briefly take up our final question for today concerning the concept of regression. The fracturing of the ego in the dream was understood by Freud as a kind of regression. Lacan uses his registers in a way that avoids this problematic concept, a concept that only emerged out of a difficulty identified with Freud's schemas. Lacan even states that if Freud already could have used the term imaginary, then it would have removed a large number of the contradictions concerning his concept of regression. The problematic nature of regression results from a dissociation between perception and consciousness, as well as for conceiving of perception as something primary and not as composite. If we recall from the last video, perception, according to Lacan, is always already a kind of flux without integration and constancy. All we have are momentary anchor points that allow for fixed identifications that are ever so fragile. And so instead of regression, when the real is encountered in a dream, the imaginary forms, unsupported by the unifying function of the signifier as they are in waking life, can no longer hold. 
giving way to the normal component parts of perception. And so this concludes the section of seminar two entitled the Freudian schemata of the psychic apparatus. In this section, we explore the first two major schemas developed by Freud as found in the project for scientific psychology and the interpretation of dreams. From this, we see the early formulations of what becomes the death drive and are presented with Freud's distinct approach to biology. We are then introduced into some concepts, including censorship, resistance, and regression. Finally, we're provided some insights into Lacan's own approach to dream interpretation in light of his three registers. In the following video, we move into the next major section of Seminar 2, entitled Beyond the Imaginary, the Symbolic, or From the Little to the Big Other. I'd like to take a moment and thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. And as always, thank you for watching. Until next time, be well.